Welcome, ladies, to the Real Estate Investor Show, providing inspiration, strategies, and insight to empower women investors to live balanced and financially free lives. Now, here are your co-hosts, Liz and Andressa. So in today's episode, we have Whitney Hutton. She is from uh, Good Egg Investments, and she also has her own uh, investment company. She's a partner in over $378 million worth of real estate, which is a lot of money. So she's got tons of experience, right, Andressa? Yes, she is and, just a powerhouse. Yeah, super, and she's just a super person. Her path has been really uh, not overnight. And you know, she really talks a lot about on today's interview, which I think you women will really appreciate. She talks about her path and how it started in 2002, which was a long time ago. <laughs> um, what I think you'll appreciate most is she talks a lot about scaling. We hear a lot about scaling. We talk a lot about it. It's a, kind of a sexy topic. How do we scale our portfolio? She really helps break it down. If you're not involved in multifamily and it's something you want to get involved in and you do have other rental portfolio, how do you really scale? Because you got to be taken seriously by banks and by brokers and all the people that are, you're going to look to do business with. And she talks and she gives some great tips on how to do that. Absolutely. And one of the first steps is vetting, vetting people and vetting the companies. At the beginning, she was focusing on turnkey properties out of state, right? So as another layer. So she shared with us what are the questions to ask those companies and make sure it is a good fit for both parties. And then later on for syndications, right? We talk about general partnerships and LPs and what are the differences and where, how can we get started? So when you are getting started, one of the best options is really to partner up with people that already have done it. So how do you vet them if you've never done that before? So she was very kind and share a lot of strategies, great strategies that you can put in place to ask those syndicators when you were looking to either do business with them or just curious to understand how things work. Because believe me, you got to understand how things work beyond the purchase of the, the, the asset itself. So this is a non-negotiable for me. You got to listen to this one. It's just great. If you're looking to scale your business and do uh, larger deals, this is a must listen. Enjoy the episode. Investors, as we all know, financing deals in today's market can be a bit challenging at times. If you're looking at funding your next real estate transaction, we are so excited to introduce to you Fund That Flip. Fund That Flip is a lending partner and dedicated to grow your real estate investment portfolio. They specialize in fix and flip, buy and hold, new construction, and cash out refi for one to four units. Ladies, we've known the founder, Matt, and his team for many years now, and we can assure you that their support goes beyond just lending money. They become a true partner. So if you're looking for great terms and reliable service, check out fundaflip.com slash invest her. Welcome back, ladies. This is Liz. And this is Andressa. Welcome back to the Real Estate Invest Her Show, where we are uh, on a mission, a very, very big mission to uh, support women in financial freedom and living a balanced life and whatever balance look like, looks like to you. So we thank you for listening. We come back every week to give you hopefully lots of value, some amazing women that we interview. Whitney, I want to welcome Whitney on our show before, as I said, amazing woman, I want to segue to you. So thank you for being on our show. We're going to jump into your story in a moment. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. That's amazing. Yeah. We're excited to jump into her story. She's got so many really neat things that she's up to and her path is really inspiring. Um, before we go there, we just like to um, get connected to all of you and just share something that is coming up for us personally or in our business, in our real estate business or in our life to hopefully give you a little nugget before we get into our, our interview. Uh, what is on the top of your list? You know, I don't want to cry. I'll just say that. So I'm just <laughs> oh gonna, my gosh, I'm let's get that started before I get into it. Um, but I really wanted to share something that's been really helping me, um, and I don't want to cry because it is something that's kind of uh, really tough to share. Um, but I'm going to share it really quick and then share what 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 the inspiring part of this is. Um, but I want to share it because it's kind of on my heart to share. Um, my friend who moved through cancer last year, it came back. 
Um, so, mm. so I'm okay. I'm, I don't want to cry. But why I want to share this with all of you, because when something difficult's happening, excuse me, happening, I should have brought some water up. Of course, I have nothing in my cup here. Um, when something's difficult happening, it's really easy to focus on what it is, right? So what I can do right now in hearing this news, I and mean, she's my best friend from college. I roomed with her all four years of college. So she's a very dear friend of mine. But what you can do is focus on what's, what's going on, what's wrong. So if I think about her, I can think about her having cancer right now and how it's spread. So that's one choice. Or because that's what she's thinking about, right? That's what she's focused on. Or whatever, you're, whatever situation you're dealing with. Or as her friend, I can see her healthy. I can see her whole. I can see her cancer-free. So every day I'm choosing to see her cancer-free. I'm waking up and I see her and I sitting on the beach having a cocktail or many cocktails. <laughs> um, I see her and I chatting, laughing, and that's what I'm holding. So every time my head goes to worry and sadness, I'm focused on seeing her healthy. So I share that with all of you not to cry on our podcast today, but to share with you that we all have difficult things in our world. So you might be dealing with debt. You might be dealing with a loss of money. You might be dealing with a loss of anything. Or you might be dealing with just a tough situation, a contractor, right? And every day you wake up thinking about that contractor how he's not going to be there on time or not get you what you want to get or not get the material that you need or whatever the issues are. Instead of seeing that contractor, getting the job done and seeing what you want to see, not what's going on. So I just share that because I've been using it in my life. I always found visualization is very powerful, but it's really hard right now because I just, I worry, right? Because that's the human part of us is we worry about stuff, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a friend of yours, that just got some really tough news. So I want to encourage you to keep seeing what you want to see, not what, what is, because that's going to stop you. And it's only going to, everyone else is worried. I want to, I want to see my friend and I having a good time. That's what I'm going to hold. And every time, every time I talk to her, I tell you're going to get through this. And this is what I, I keep texting her. This is the vision I have. You and I are sitting on the beach. Mm -hmm. We're laughing. We're joking around. I'm having a drink and rambling on about something, maybe falling asleep because I fall asleep a lot. <laughs> Whatever it is, but I, that's, that's true. That's what that's I want to sleep. Hold. Yes. And I think as, as friends and as women, we have tough stuff that goes on, but we need to hold what we want to see, not what yeah. is. So, you know, Liz, you, you're such an amazing friend because, you know, my heart goes to your, your best friend. You know that I'm, I'm, I heard um, you talking about her before, share with me and you always keep not just her, but me and everybody around. Liz is the type of friend that's going to share with you. I see you whole. I see this getting closed. I see this being resolved. I see peace, healing. And I think that that's just like a, a choice that she makes every day. And sometimes we're like, oh, this is not natural to me. I don't think it's natural to anybody, right? But it is a choice that we we made. And one thing that Liz is talking is about the, the frequency, right? You focus on what you want, not what you don't want. So the universe doesn't understand. No. So what do you say? Oh, I don't want X, Y, and Z. Instead of doing that, that's the frequency that you are shooting out there saying, I want peace, I want healing, and that's my vision. So my listening of the situation change. I choose to see you in a different way, and I think it's so beautiful. And if you, I do believe if you go that, that route over and over again, the other person, a Liz friend, for example, she has no other choice but start seeing her like that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I keep talking about it, I will keep crying. So I'm going to keep moving <laughs> here. But thank you for saying that. And just keep, keep that vision in your mind of whatever you want to see. So without further ado, Whitney, thank you for being on our show. Thank you for um, sharing your story with us and all the women listening to this show uh, and, and are on this journey with us. So thank you for being here. Um, we always like to sh you know, kind of kick things off and ask you and your own you know, viewpoint, what propelled you to get involved in real estate investing? And we'll start there. 
Well, first, thank you for having me on. It's amazing to, you know, be here with you two and just get to speak to the community and share my story. And hopefully somebody finds a glimmer of hope or inspiration or empowerment and can carry that forward in their own dreams. Um, my story really begins um, accidentally in 2002. I purchased a home with a significant other um, about a month after we closed. <laughs> um, the relationship crumbled and here I I had a house, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to um, look at it. I purchased the house with zero of my own money. I had borrowed money from family members, so but I had to pay back that debt. Um, and I'd also borrowed from the bank. So I uh, just got a bunch of roommates to live with me who didn't mind living in a construction zone. Fast forward 11 months later, I got all the repairs made, sold the home to kind of get out from underneath it. And then I was like, wait a second, I've just made $52,000, hadn't been paying anything for housing. Not only that, I had been making, putting money in my pocket every month. I'm like, this is awesome. I need to do this again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I quickly, um, being fairly naive, thought I had it all figured out, um, decided I wanted to move where I wanted to live, which was into a small mountain town here in Colorado, bought a house thought I could repeat the exact same strategy and then just realized over the course of the next year that I had violated pretty much every immutable law of real estate. I had bought in the relocation, the wrong house, didn't have a good exit strategy. Um, in 2006, I finally was able to sell that home. Uh, on paper, it looked like I took a big loss, but again, um, there was a glimmer of hope. You know, I, in, in some aspects, real estate can be somewhat forgiving. And I actually had uh, broken even through all the cash flow I was able to accumulate. Um, I had a kind of an oops when I was exiting that house. My neighbor's bus fell into the roof of the property um, a day after close. So there was a lot of um, legal contention there, but mm -hmm. navigated that rather well, thanks to my realtor. And then I'm sitting here again with my down payment, figure, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And at this point in time, my husband was like, we're, we're not buying a house. No way you're not going to get me to do this. And I'm like, well, we got a list somewhere. So um, we started doing live-in um, flipping for ourselves from there and did a couple projects and then took pause in 2008 when the housing market took off on us. We couldn't continue to flip up. Um, we didn't know how to re-leverage the money and really just kind of set it aside, set the strategy aside for a couple of years. And it wasn't until 2016, whenever the whole election went down, my husband works for the government and we just saw at the end just how much of a political pawn his benefits were. And we're, you know, why it took us that long to realize that our future just was not in our control. I, you know, at least we learned the lesson. But we decided, you know, hey, we've got a small family now. We got to figure this out. So um, we took the plunge and started buying rental real estate at that point in time. And we bought. So really, that's where our journey took off. Is in 2016 when we bought a house on Christmas Eve. Wow. So, you know, when I think about your your journey, there's so many ups, downs, turns, and turn again. <laughs> Right. And I think that that's, that's how journeys are. And sometimes mm -hmm. we have the wrong expectations of people thinking, oh my gosh, I'm buying this house and I'm having this issue, that issue. And now there's another one coming up. Um, this might be a sign that this is not for me and I'm going to quit. And, you know, it's just part of the process. Right. Mm -hmm. If, if oh, you're playing, if you're playing a game and you don't know the rules of the game, you might be thinking, "Oh, that's not the game for me." But actually, you don't know the the rules. That's that's how it's supposed to be. Either you, you know, ride that wave as you as you did, take pauses, breathe, readjust, reassess. And then go again. So talking about 2016, when you guys came back, what made you guys choose the exit strategy? What are the factors that you combine and put it together and saw, okay, the best exit strategy for us is rentals or wholesaling or fix and flip or apartments. Tell me what was the thought process at that moment? Yeah, so... 
Interestingly enough, uh, we knew that we wanted cash flow. So we were focused on buying cash flow rental real estate. We wanted to buy and hold for a little bit of appreciation, but also the cash flow. Uh, we still didn't have it all figured out. I mean, we still took a big lump on that first property uh, because we, after we purchased it, we quickly, re- we were self-managing and we quickly realized that we were making $400 a month on a $65,000 down purchase. That's not good returns for what we wanted. So it, over the course of the next probably four or five months, we struggled to get more homes under contract just in the competitive market. We're in Boulder, Colorado. So it was really at that point in time, over that four month period of probably seeing no less than a hundred houses getting beat out left and right, that that was probably the best thing that could have happened to us because I, it gave us enough time to realize that we weren't in a strategy that was gonna meet our actual needs. Uh, we needed the appreciation for our retirement fund. We needed the cash flow to supplant income. My job, I was, you know, I, I could see that I was going to be downsized in the next year. Our whole department in my company, everybody above me had been let go. It was just a matter of time before it rolled downhill to me. So we decided to move out of state. And so over the course of the, that year, we were able to reposition our equity and purchase nine more properties out of state. Mm. So, yeah. Uh, so the, again, focusing on cash flow, being in linear markets so we could capture a little bit of appreciation. And we eventually, over the course of the next two years, scaled our portfolio to almost 30 properties. Wow. And you, you bored that, those strategies or uh, those strategies, <laughs> you bored those properties <laughs> or, or, or you did choose a different strategy? Yeah, we, our first few out of state, we, you know, like most people, we were pretty nervous. We didn't know that the markets. Um, we chose two markets where we had a little bit of knowledge about, not extensive knowledge. We had friends in, we had family in. Um, but we chose to go turnkey for the first couple just to kind of get to understand the different pieces of the puzzle. You know, how do you work with a property manager? Because up until that time, we had always managed our own properties. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you purchase from a distance? How do you put that team in place and trust the information you're, you're getting from that team. So, um, but we knew that we only had so much capital to execute like that. At some point in time, we had to transition into um, a better strategy, uh, whether it was purchasing off the MLS or figuring out how to purchase, you know, uh, from wholesalers and other, you know, contractors and stuff. So over the course of that next year, it was really a crash course. We went from turnkey and then we transitioned into buying properties that were undervalued on the MLS and doing a little bit of work ourselves with our property managers. And then eventually leveraged our property managers to step into full, <clears throat> pardon me, first strategy where we were working with wholesalers to purchase properties. And that's again, you know, so we, by the end of our first year, we were at 10. And then by through the course of the following year, we got up to 28 properties total and which was huge for us and i sat there and i looked at my husband and i'm like this is amazing i have enough income now i can step away from my job and you know be spend time with our daughter can i do that and he goes that's awesome i want some of that <laughs> yeah I went, no, uh, I don't do that. <laughs> and you know it's it just the whole kind of the wheels I, I at that point in time i'm like yes he's full on board with me he's coming to the dark side and then I kind of took pause and I'm like, wait a second, if it took 28 to get me for out of my, you know, replace my income, it's going to, he had all the benefits. It's going to take at least 35, 40. We had to figure out a different strategy. <laughs> mm. Before we go to that, that different strategy. So, so mm-hmm. a couple questions, because I think out of state investing is a very common um, need for a lot of women when they're assessing, you know, their, their local market isn't just, isn't going to necessarily work for a strong rental market, or there's a lot of reasons for it, but many of us look out of state. I have properties out of state. Um, it's just a common, a common thread, but it is scary, right? You're not 10 minutes from the property. You're not a half hour from the property. So what were some of your initial steps from, you know, and how far were you from these properties? Just out of curiosity, were you on a plane ride or is it a drive? Uh, from most of them were either a plane ride or a drive. Um, but we, you know, again, we're in Boulder, Colorado, just outside of Denver 
and uh, we could get to Indianapolis, which is where we started, or Kansas City in probably under, you know, in a half a day if we needed to. Okay. So what were some of your first steps? Yeah, we all know we need to study the market. We need to build a team. Those are, you know, common, you know, kind of common things. But even more specifically, what were some of your initial steps to set you up? I know tur- it went from turnkey to more hands-on. We're doing this. So what were those steps to get you there? So you weren't just completely passive and hands-off, which is more turnkey. So I wish that I could impart that our, on our initial journey that we had done the whole entire market analysis and then evaluated vacancy and unemployment and job diversification. I wish we, I could say that we'd gone through that. Uh, we did do a lot of research, but it wasn't very formally put together. So we were looking at strong markets that we knew were growing, but it was all kind of our impressions of what we were reading and talking to different investors, talking to different turnkey companies. Um, What I did do right is that I talked to over 40 different turnkey companies before Mm. settling on a provider in markets. So we were able to glean a lot of information from that. Uh, Anybody getting started now, I would suggest to kind of turn that, that process on its head and do your market research first, choose the market and then go find the provider. So for the, I don't want to miss that opportunity, right? So let's say market first, I found my my market regarding the provider. If my exit strategy, if I'm looking to buy a turnkey, how do you vet the provider? What are the questions that must have questions that people need to do in order to make sure that they're choosing the right provider? Well, when you're working with a turnkey provider, you're sourcing a deal finder as well as your property management at the same time. So it would be the same questions as if you were sourcing a realtor or a wholesaler and a property management. Um, I like for turnkey companies, if I were going to do it all over again, I would, um, and, and this was something that we were pretty conscious of to begin with, is looking for turnkey companies that are vertically integrated. You do have operations out there where the turnkey provider just sources the deal, does the construction, and they place it with outside property management. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you lose a little bit of the um, accountability should something go wrong in the construction. I know there's, you know, some providers will, you know, give warranties for six months or a year or in certain parts of work, but it's really hard to hold that person accountable when it, once you've placed it with property management that it's not theirs. Um, so if you're sourcing a turnkey provider, I would make sure to ask them all the questions that you would, you know, a realtor. Uh, what is, you know, what is the, your strategy? Um, for the building, are you looking at single family, small multifamily, uh, you know, duplexes, quads? Um, where's your bread and butter? How are you sourcing the deals? What are the different markets to invest in? The sub markets of the area? What is the typical class of property you're dealing with? And then double check all numbers. So I, where I see people get in a lot of trouble is turnkey providers will put together performance and pass it along to the investor. Um, the investor needs to make sure that the turnkey provider's numbers are actually real, you know, that they're using, you know, true numbers for vacancy, that they're including capex and maintenance. I see a lot of providers not putting that in because they say that the, everything's completely rehabbed, all the capex is taken care of for the next seven years, so you don't have to set aside anything for capex and maintenance. That's not true. Re- Appliances break. Tenants are incredibly hard on appliances. I just want to pause a little bit. Can you tell me what that is? Because a lot of people that are hearing us are not familiar with it. Uh, With CapEx and maintenance? Yeah. Okay. So CapEx is capital expenditure. So think of this as, um, you know, like your roof, your foundation, your water heater, your HVAC, your air conditioner, things that are large expenditures that are going to occur um, every few years. Yes. When you rehab a property, you want to, if you're going to take the time and effort to do that, you want to include all that up front in the rehab to, so you don't have to incur those costs in the first few years of holding the property. However, even if you held the property 30 years, you're going to have to replace the roof again. You're going to have to replace the water heater at some point in time. Um, you're going to have to update countertops, um, that that's just, you know, part of having a home, whether it's a rental or your primary. Mm -hmm. 
and then maintenance would just be ongoing maintenance. It could be, you know, pest control, you know, cleaning out the gutters, changing the filters, you know, uh, on the, air, you know, the HVAC system, you know, ha bringing a plumber in, you know, every once in a while to check your sewer line, make sure everything's, you know, tightened up and no water is leaking. Very cool. So, um, so we were talking a little bit about how you're able to, um, how you're able to really grow out of state, your out of state portfolio to, to that 30. Um, so, you know, obviously, like you said, if you had to do it over again, really getting more, more of that market analysis, which I think is so important. I tell often people, I felt we wanted to find cheap property. That was our big criteria when we started. <laughs> it was not more than that. You know, there's obviously that's not what we'd look for now, but it's funny how you start. You don't have those, those other important market kind of analysis, you know, uh, strategies. That's a great point. And then, so, so building your team out of state, any learn lessons that you, you, you got, because I do want to transition on how you'd be able to scale and get your husband out of his job. We're going to go there next, but I'm really curious though, you know, everyone says building a team, oh, just build a team and find some local people. I, it's just not as simple as that because I've done it and we've done it. it it's, it, it is simple in that you do need to find local people, but there's a lot of pieces in that. And so I'm curious, how did you, most importantly, how did you find people to treat your properties as an owner? Because yeah, we can find property managers, we can find turnkey providers, that's a dime a dozen, but to find local people that value the property like you do, right? You're going to look at, look at it like you would as an owner being there more often. I'm curious, how did you build that side of your team? So uh, trial and error and a ton of networking. Uh, that's the short answer to that. Uh, you know, my experience, it, and I would say, even if you do get somebody that is very experienced and does treat your properties very well, uh, you have to continue to work with them because over time their business is going to change as well. So case in point, when we were in Indianapolis, uh, we were with, an, I felt like a very amazing local property management company. They got bought out by mm. a big behemoth. And then all of a sudden we were low man on the totem pole, uh, service plummeted nearly overnight. Mm. So I think this is where you have to step in and hold that property. Even if you have somebody that's amazing, you have to hold them accountable and have a backup in the market. I think that's where some investors get in trouble that they only have right. one property manager. I would always have two in every market and maybe a third one that you've vetted. And don't be afraid to hire slow, fire fast. Yep. Great suggestion. So talking about, I'm sorry, Liz, go ahead. That's okay. No, I was going to, I was going to transition. So before, before you transition to the, the scaling and uh, retiring your, your husband, I just want to talk about the skill from, the amount of uh, rental properties that you had in order for you to, to acquire more. What processes did you put in place? You mentioned about the property management company. Did they handle everything or did you put any processes in place and, and tools and things that made you able to scale your portfolio? I actually leveraged my property manager. I was working with a property manager in Kansas City who was um, had a very had a smaller business. I would probably look for property management now, where the um, the property manager has 250, 300 units or more. That tells me that they have scale in their systems. Mm -hmm. This particular property manager had about 100 units, and he was hungry very hungry, very driven. And so it just made a good partnership for us. Uh, he was sourcing more deals than he could possibly um, put out mm -hmm. for turnkey or flip. And I was able to partake in those systems in order to scale quickly. So I leveraged, you know, my property manager to get that done. Yeah. And I think finding those partners and those team members that are hungry, because you could take really good property managers and they're not hungry at growing and they're just like, oh, this is just going to be another 10 units, 15 units. It's like, no, no, this is really important. This is your baby, right? This is your, what you own. Totally. So in terms of scaling a little bit, you know, we talk a lot about scaling. I, I feel like everyone wants to scale their portfolio, right? If you, if, you, if you pulled all the people listening to this episode, I think everyone would, like a lot of people would say, I want to scale, whatever scaling looks like to them. So for you, you got the 28 out of state, you started to get some you have a portfolio in place. Your husband's like, hold on, you know, I'm done with this, with this, with this as well. How do we do that? You're like, hold on, we can't just do 28. We got to do more. 
And then you, it doesn't sound like from some of the questions we, you answered that you both were super aligned on how you're going to do that. So I'd love to dive into that. You know, how was that, what did that look like with those conversations and what did you end up deciding to do and why? Wow. Very interesting. I actually haven't ever been asked this before. Um, but it, it's something that I think, you know, especially if you're in any type of relationship, trying to build a business together as a couple that you struggle with is how do you, one partner is probably more driven to drive the business and, and get it going. The other partner, you know, for whatever reason might be more questioning or rebellious against it. In this case, my husband, he is extremely supportive of what I wanted to do. Um, but he, he didn't, he didn't really want to have anything to do with it. He was like, okay, you go do you. Um, and it was when, after he saw the power of what I was able to create passively, you know, keep in mind, I was still working a full-time job, mother. Um, I was taking care of family members. I was the guardian of my grandparents and I was dealing with my aging mother at the time. Uh, it, it, I was able to create something that was very time leveraged. So he saw in that moment, that, wow, this actually could very well work for us. So from there, I think he thought it was as easy as us adding another, you know, 40, 50 units. Or he's like, why? Let's just keep doing this. This is awesome. Um, I'm sitting here looking at it. I'm the one that's managing, you know, the day to day with the property manager. And I'm like, no way. Not at all. Uh -uh. <laughs> like, no, lose my hair here. <laughs> like, even if I wasn't working full time, no way. I, I, I didn't want to do that. So we turned to multifamily. We knew we had to start picking up properties and, you know, more units in mm -hmm. one transaction in order to make that happen. And to back it up a little bit, um, I had a couple syndications held in an IRA. We can all argue whether that's a good strategy to put syndications in our IRA, but leaving that conversation aside, I really um, hadn't thought much of them. You know, I was treating them kind of like a mutual fund, like, okay, great, I'm invested in real estate, I'm just gonna like set it aside. So as I'm sitting here trying to figure out what market are we gonna go into, you know, with a multifamily purchase, finding the realtors, finding property management, trying to put together that team, again, re-engineering our entire system. I kept kind of like looking back over here at these multifamilies and watching them, or these syndications and watching how they were performing in my portfolio. I'm like, wait a second. I am actually not beating those returns mm. that much. And I'm like, why don't I just go this direction? This is kind of the easier glide path. Um, part of what we were bumping into is that we didn't have a track record with multifamily. We had to go and leverage partners. Uh, we didn't exactly know how to do that. So that's really where we, when we started making that pivot into multifamily, we started off in syndication as limited partners. Wow. Partners. So talking about syndications, I would talk about um, vetting uh, the uh, turnkey companies. How about syndication? How do one, if you don't have experience uh, doing syndication and you see the potential, but you don't have even, like, what should I ask when I'm talking to them? So for, for the ladies that are that see the potential, they want to do that, they want to pivot, same situation as you are, quite different, um, what they should be asking the syndicators? So, and I can speak from this from experience for, with some of the people that I work with, they get caught up on the number in the deal. They get very um, starry-eyed about their returns. That's our, I feel like our training as we, I know for me, at least being brought up, like you're focused on stock market returns. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's Apple or Google or Facebook or whatever, you're focused on the return. Um, in syndication, you're in, you've moved to that, if you call it the cash flow quadrant, you know, Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow quadrant, you're the investor investing in somebody else's business. It doesn't matter how good the deal is, you have to underwrite the investment team. So, what is their track record? You know, what, where are they coming from? You know, who are their partners? Who are their capital partners? Um, you know, have they gone full cycle with the deal? Have they refinanced the deal? Have they been tested? Do they have any loans or excuse me, defaults, foreclosures, judgments against them? 
um, bankruptcy. Uh, and then just, you know, again, diving into their business, what is their, their philosophy around investing? You know, what is their bread and butter asset class? What are the markets that they're in? What is their, their, their plan going forward with the different types of investments that they're bringing on? Um, I think even people get confused if they're investing in one syndication, which is an LLC that holds one building, or are they investing in a fund? Mm -hmm. So I've, I've seen people get in themselves into a fund. They want to liquidate. And I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. You have to wait until all the properties are liquidated out of that fund before you can get out. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah. Uh. So um, I think it's going back and vetting the team. And as if you were buying a business. That would be how I would do it. And it's not, um, it's, it's definitely something that you have to learn because that you want to make sure the team's preserving your capital. Um, my investment philosophy, I want them creating cash flow immediately mm. in areas that are going to appreciate and that they're aiming, you know, to generate tax benefits with the investment. And let me ask you one thing that, about the asset management, right? So we all know that the properties are purchased and then the construction comes in order to add value the majority of the deals and then the refinance of all of that. Uh, do you go deeply about the asset management itself? Uh, how much is going to be uh, the estimated construction, the time frame? who is going to do that, especially as if it is uh, outside uh, state? Oh, it's, you know, if we're talking about syndication, I think that's very important because that's going to affect your capital preservation and your cash flow numbers. If the, I've seen um, business plans where cash flow is suspended for the first couple of years, my question is, are they raising enough capital at the onset of the investment? Uh, or are they using cash flow from the investment to do repairs? For me, uh, you know, I'm not a fan of suspending that cash flow for the first couple of years because if something happens, a fire happens, a natural disaster, an economic disaster. And now you've put the business plan at risk and you can't execute. So I like performance where the, the operator is raising enough funds to execute the, the capital expenditures on the building. For um, how long, though, you would say for or it depends? It, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite answer. It depends. <laughs> it's funny. We, um, uh, a friend of mine and I run a women's investing real estate meetup. Um, we were there on Monday night and um, we were actually talking about market analysis with, you know, 19 women in the room. It was amazing. And all the questions that were answered, every single one of them were like, uh, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> the, we would answer them, but it wasn't, you couldn't give a blanket like, yes, for no. sure or definitive timeline on that. But yeah, I would, I would say it depends. Uh, I would, if the, the, if you're getting into more of a developmental type deal where you're dealing, ripping off roofs, repairing foundations, ripping out, replacing electrical, and I'm not talking about electrical fixtures, but you know, full on electrical, um, you know, adding units, I'd like to see more money raised up front. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. The <clears throat> back to the transitioning to not just vet, uh, syndicators, but you, you, you know, the women that are listening want to become one, right? They want to get into larger multifamily. Yeah. Um, so obviously that track record is everything because brokers won't take you seriously. No one will take you seriously, banks, et cetera. So obviously leveraging partners, I think is a great idea. It's a great strategy. Um, you know, so you can build your track record. What else do I, I listening to this show and, um, I've, I've got, you know, 30 rentals, you know, I've done deals. I know I have that track record, but I don't have the larger multifamily track record. What else can they do? What else can they do to set themselves up for success so that they can be that lead on a um, multifamily that they want to purchase? They don't want to just be passive. They don't want to just put their money into something. They actually want to lead it. So leveraging partners, track record, I'm curious to get your perspective on what else they can do to set themselves up for success. Yeah, that's actually the kind of the path that I'm on. Um, so just, you know, strategies that, and, um, you know, tips that I'm picking up along the way. One, leverage the heck out of your, your current units. You know, if you have 30 units in your belt, that is a small multifamily. It can be treated like that if, you're, if you position that kind of like on a resume. Mm -hmm. um, bringing in partners to, you know, understanding what your strengths are, bringing in partners to complement, you know, your opportunities that you have. 
So, you know, if all you have under your belt is, you know, single family rentals, find somebody to partner with initially on a deal that has done multifamily before. You can leverage their experience whenever you're going to the bank and talking to realtors because you have somebody on the general partnership team. Um, another way that I've seen people do it is actually going in as an LP on a syndication, voicing that they want to learn more along the way. Um, now you won't, you know, being an LP is a very specific role. You don't have any voting, voting rights, you know, depending on how the, you know, PPM is structured, yeah. but you can leverage that because you are partner, you are controlling real estate. You are a partner. You have, you are controlling units that way. And I honestly have not seen many banks or realtors question that, you know, when you see, you know, somebody says I control the X units of real estate, the real, you know, Lenders aren't going, okay, how? Are you the LP or the GP? You know, some savvy ones will. But. That's what I was going to say. Did they even like, no? I, like, it, like if, I don't think they, okay, I control this. I don't, I'll be very, very surprised if somebody says, okay, are you the general or are you the limited partner? What's mm -hmm. the, it's a rare conversation. It, is it your experience or you have seen very savvy lenders? I've, I've actually on a, on a, honestly only had one lender ask of everybody that I've talked to. And he asked more out of curiosity than anything else. And it didn't really impact the direction of the lending. Wow. To me, it's something that I don't know, as a, I'm thinking right now, and it's fine that they don't, they don't ask, but as a lender, don't you think that they should know if you're general, like for liability purpose, for experience, for your background and everything else? Well, I think they're, they're, they can get at that from other directions. Now, mm -hmm. whether somebody is outright asking, um, you know, they're going to want, again, a lender is going to want to protect the downside in their investment. They want to know if you can exit most, especially if you're getting some sort of bridge loan. Um, they want to know that you can exit. So they want to know, that somebody on the team has done that. If you haven't done that, you know, you know, you probably haven't as an LP investor, you need to bring somebody on to complement that and be like, yeah, this person on my team has repositioned an asset. They've done a refinance. They've sold mm -hmm. an asset. So that's yeah. a great point. And I think that for the ladies that are, that want to start doing syndications, partnering up, it makes so much sense instead of start raising. I, I heard, I think it was Kathy uh, Fatke that mentioned that somebody came to her and I think she was 21, something like that. And she was like, yeah, I want to get started in real estate. I'm just planning on doing my first indication. And she said, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Because first of all, who is this lender that is going to, you know, ask you what's your background and say, yeah, just starting out. Who is the the LPs that are going to trust that you're going to perform and you have all, all, all the, you know, next steps, figure it out. So I think that there's no, I don't see it. Do you see any other way that somebody wants to get into this game first besides partnering up with a journal? Do you see any other? I, I, I personally, I don't. And I, and I'll sit, I, I'll come at it from a different direction. I mean, one person, I would challenge whether they can handle all aspects of the syndication, doing sure. asset, asset acquisition, asset management. Um, There's so many pieces of the puzzle. I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's and everybody has their zone of genius. Go find somebody who that is their zone of genius. That's what you want. That's going to, yeah. you know, we talked about underwriting the operations team. You, you know, you're going to get more investors if you have a strong operations team uh, where everybody's operating in their zone of genius, that it's going to make that, that process a lot smoother for you too. So uh, why wouldn't you? Right it up. We're talking about time balance right here at the end. Like, don't take on all the roles. <laughs> yeah, and leveraging, leveraging time, funds, experience, all of that. I'm all about leveraging. If I can delegate and focus on what I'm good at, that's what I'm doing. OP, yeah. other people's blank, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I would add too. When you're talking with folks um, that you may want to like 
maybe, you know, be that limited partner and eventually get more on the, the general partner side just because they have unit counts under their belt. And, but I, that's one thing, but I think that the actual, like you're saying, Whitney, about, you know, have you refinanced? Have you gone through full cycle? Um, have you, did you invest in the downside? Did you invest in the upside? I mean, that's really important mm -hmm. questions. You got to look at people's experience. Um, I don't say people have to have 30 years experience, but experience helps because you've been through different times, been ups and downs, and, and whether it's you personally or whether it's your team, that helps. And I can't tell you how many syndication teams I run into where on their whole team, they don't have more than like a year of experience. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's you know, and, and again, not saying they're doing anything wrong. I don't know. I'm not sure if I had, you know, if I had my, our money, we usually put in our own deals. But if I had money that I'm looking to, to invest in other people's deals, don't know if they would be my first call. You know, that may make me nervous uh, if their collective only had that experience. Um, that's tough, you know. So again, I think you have to vet people out to your own comfort level. I'm not saying that's not wrong, wrong but you have to, just because people have buildings under, under their belt, they own buildings and they're in their quote unquote speaking on syndication does not mean they have any like deep experience and, and I've personally seen it. So, and I'm sure you've seen it, Whitney. Mm -hmm. um, you have just to ask say that. the tough questions. Yeah. You know, I see, and like I said, you know, for, as on the investor side, I see a lot of investors get in trouble because they didn't ask the tough questions. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, Whitney, there's so many other questions we want to ask you, but I love your, I love your path. And I know you guys are up to some amazing things at Good Egg Investments, which I really wanted you to share a little bit about, you know, where the women listening can learn about you. And you're really just rock star team, really, uh, really like your team a lot. You know, Annie and Julie are great people and you are as well. So just share a little bit where women can learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. You can visit us at goodegginvestments.com. Uh, we, uh, you know, invest in multifamily syndication, our bread and butter, Texas, Florida, and the Carolinas. Uh, you can find out more about us there and sign up for a free seven day, um, learn how to invest in syndication course. Very cool. And you guys just launched a new podcast. Congrats. Yeah. Uh, I was on, I was on one of the, I don't know when it's getting released, but I know I was, I was interviewed. So I was excited to be on it and you guys are doing some great things. So yeah, it's you know, actually, it'll, it will be released uh, whenever this episode comes out. Okay, cool. Nice. Cool. Yeah. I'm recording mine pretty soon too. So I'm very excited about it. So for all of you that are listening, all this information is going to be on our show notes. And now we're going to transition to our fabulous three questions. And the first one is, what's the most transformational book you have ever read? For me, hands down, that's The One Thing by uh, Gary Carroll, Keller and Jay Papasan. Awesome. The second question is, what's the most powerful routine that you do to create a financially free and balanced life? Ah, so my, we've started this process a couple years ago, but my husband and I, um, I'm the goal setter in the family. My husband plays along, answers my questions, <laughs> he hates me. Um, but we started actually sitting down and doing a couple's goal setting retreat in towards the end of October, beginning of November every year. We've been doing it for the past two years. Trust me, the more you do it, the easier it gets. But it really helps us create alignment of what we want in all areas of our life. And then I'm you know, the process person, I can break that down into the tiniest little domino that if you flick it over, it'll just, that goal will fall. So it allows us to break everything down into really focused, you know, activities that need to fall in our calendar. If it doesn't meet the buckets that we set at that goal setting retreat, we don't do it. Awesome. And the last question is, which woman famous or not has inspired you the most? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, uh, Liz, your story just really impacted me. I mean, for me, it's my mom and my mother-in-law. Um, I, you know, both women are, could, are just couldn't be any more different. Um, but my mother um, struggled, you know, with, you know, a disease that she just couldn't kick for many years of her life. And I saw her, you know, so much pain, so much loss, so much hardship. But I just learned so many different valuable lessons from her on how to live life and how to see life as it could be, not what it is. Um, and my mother-in-law is the epitome of that. That's just how, again, she's had incredible pain and loss and hardship in her life. And she just sees that, you know, everything's rose-colored glasses. And you're just like, I, I don't know how you do it, but 
you know, it's, um, it's really, it's really inspiring to have people in your life that can, you know, show you those valuable lessons early on. Wonderful. Um, Whitney, thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks for sharing all your great insight, your path, and love what you guys are doing, you know, you and your team. Uh, So keep up the amazing work you're doing. And, you know, thanks for sharing some of your tips with us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Whitney. Yeah. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to receive updates on our next interviews, go to our website, therealestateinvestor.com. There, you can subscribe to our show, become part of our investor community, and get updates on upcoming episodes. If you like our show, please share it with other women who would benefit. And don't forget to leave us a rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And as always, we encourage you to take one action as a result of today's show and put it into motion so you can live both a financially free and balanced life. Thanks for spending time with us. Ciao.